from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the Libraries of Congress's Office of Scholarly Programs and the Motion Picture Broadcast and Recorded Sound Division of the Library, I want to welcome you to today's lecture by Dr. Joel Freikom, titled The Lost Tycoon, Rediscovering George Kleine and Reframing Early American Cinema. Now, before we begin, there's the usual cautions here. Please make sure your cell phone is off. And I want to also suggest to you that you sign up for the library's RSS feed, particularly through the Kluge Center's loc.gov, loc slash Kluge website. That's loc.gov slash loc slash Kluge. Dr. Joel Freikom is a post doctoral research associate at Stockholm University, where he teaches in the Division of Cinema Studies within the Department of Media Studies. His primary research interest is in pre-classical, or very early silent, American film. And his focus has included research on interests such as industrial and cultural change in early cinema, its historic reception, and on local film history. Joel Freikom received his PhD from Stockholm University in 2009 for a dissertation entitled Framing the Feature Film, Multi-Real Feature Film and American Film Culture in the 1910s. And he was awarded for that year the honor of best dissertation published by Stockholm University, Faculty of the Humanities. As a John W. Kluge Fellow here at the Library of Congress, his work has addressed the American film pioneer, George Kleine. The research he has done will feed into a much larger project funded by the Swedish Research Council entitled From Business Commodities to Revered Cultural Heritage, Global Media, Vernacular Strategies, and cultural negotiations. But to segue back to the study of early American cinema and the topic of George Kleine's role in the early days of American film history, I ask you to help me welcome today Dr. Joel Freikom. Thanks very much, Mary Lou. Uh, and sorry about the delay. I'll try to read very, very fast, so you'll be out of here uh, on schedule. Uh, but before I begin, um, I'd like to thank the Kluge Center for giving me the option, opportunity to be here and taking good care of me while here, especially Mary Lou Reeker, Carolyn Brown, um, Jason Steinauer, and Travis Hensley. And also, many thanks to Charlotte Hanstad, who has been my uh, research assistant over these last couple of months. Thank you. Uh, and finally, thanks to the Motion Pictures uh, Broadcasting and Recorded Sound Division for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, today's talk is about George Kleine, and yes, it is Kleine with an E. Uh, it's not my weird Swedish accent that uh, messes the pronunciation up. Um, and as far as the title goes, um, I'll admit that I've paraphrased a Scott Fitzgerald novel that some of you might have read. And if you have read the novel, don't expect anything like that. Because uh, there were not much in common between Fitzgerald's movie mogul Monroe Starr and George Kleine. Uh, in 1913, a newspaper reporter described Kleine as quiet of manner and terribly shy. Kleine himself said that there was nothing interesting, romantic, or sensational about him. And perhaps not as a person, but I will convince you that he makes a great case for film historical rediscovery. Uh, and this lecture won't give you a complete biography or full account of Kleine's career, but I will try to uh, tell the story of how one man was caught up in the web of historical forces that led up to the, to the emergence of Hollywood. Uh, and as we shall see, Kleine's conservative business policies and his highbrow vision uh, of what he believed American cinema could become took him on a different path, 
but one that would intersect with early Hollywood many times and in revealing ways. Kleine was born in New York City in 1863, the son of German immigrants. He moved to Chicago in 1890 to start an optical goods store, um, a trade he had learned from his father. In 1896, Kleine started marketing motion picture equipment uh, and soon added motion pictures uh, to the product line. This quickly became uh, the area of business that dwarfed the others, and by 1904, Kleine had become the leading distributor of motion pictures in the United States, acting as Western sales agent for the major American film manufacturers, as well as a number of European firms. Uh, Kleine would later recall this phase, especially the period from 1906 to February 1908, as his golden days. He came out of it more or less set for life, and at one point he had actually tried to retire, but he only lasted for two months. Uh, instead, he went on uh, to become a founding member of the Motion Picture Patents Company, a trust-like combination of film companies uh, that controlled or tried to control the film industry from 1908 and a few years into the 19-teens. And there are other career events, large and small, that I could mention, but for now, what I'd like, to, what I'd like you to remember is the year 1915, uh, which will serve as our entry point today. Uh, 1915 marks a film historical turning point and a point of convergence where Kleine's career significantly intersects with larger film historical develop developments that would come to define cinema as we know it. In many ways, even though Kleine remained active in the film business until his death in 1931, he was at the peak of his career in 1915. Um, at the same juncture, um, the film industry was undergoing an extreme makeover with the emergence of Hollywood as the most crucial outcome. In addition, a frantic negotiation over the film medium's cultural status was taking place, which would eventually lead up to the recognition of film as cultural heritage, rather than as business, pure and simple. Uh, finally, American cinema embarked on a remarkably successful global expansion, establishing Hollywood cinema as global culture which added fuel to the already heated debate over the role of American cinema. So this is the basic scheme and the things I'll uh, be talking about, so now let's elaborate. Um, in the 19-teens, the American film industry underwent drastic change. The handful of film companies that had ruled the business from its inception met increasingly fierce competition, and by the mid-teens, the market was divided bet between old-timers and newcomers. But that was just the start of it. Uh, just a few years later, uh, the overhaul was complete. Nearly all of the so-called old-timers were out of business. And by 1920, a new industry structure and new business practices uh, were in place. In its mature state, this new structure uh, became known as the Hollywood studio system. Kleine was an old-timer for sure, but he didn't join the market exodus. But neither did he make a successful transition into the new era. He remained active as a distributor and producer throughout the 1920s, but he be became a marginal player, never again taking center stage, as he had done during the first 15 to 20 years of motion pictures. The question is why? And what does this case uh, tell us about the industrial transformation that was happening at the time? A possible cause of Kleiner's demise that previous historians have identified is the disastrous investment in production facilities outside, in Grugliasco, outside of Turin, uh, in Italy. Uh, Kleine was part of a joint venture to build a large motion picture studio there in which he planned to make lavish feature films with American stars in leading parts, combining what he saw as the best of the European and American methods while also taking advantage of cheap Italian labor. The studio was built and staffed, but as they were about to start cranking out the pictures, World War I broke out uh, and postponed production for what turned out to be forever. Uh, the Grugliasco fiasco did hamper Kleine's plans severely and caused a considerable economic loss. But in terms of career history, it was more of an accident than a root cause for his predicament. Assuming that Kleine was a shrewd businessman, we would predict an adaptive maneuver, a change of strategy. Indeed, Kleine did adapt by initiating, initiating production in the US. He also continued to import films as far as it was possible in wartime and his national distribution organization continued to handle Kleine's own production as well as the output of other companies. A more plausible explanation points to Kleine's reluctance to vertical integration. Vertical integration in the film business means that one company engages in all three branches, 
that is production, distribution, and exhibition, rather than specializing in one of them. And this is a key principle of the Hollywood studio system as it gradually emerged. Uh, but Kleine swam against the current. He did believe that close ties between production and distribution was practical, perhaps even necessary. But he argued that the ongoing hookup of film exhibition to the other two branches was extremely harmful. Above all, he feared that this would stifle competition and independence throughout the industry. One cause for concern uh, was the local and regional consolidation of movie theater chains. Uh, the immediate, immediate nuisance for Kleine was that these movie theater chains, or local monopolies as he would call them, uh, used their bargaining power to drive down film rental prices at the expense of distributors like Kleine. Also, they tended to limit their purchases to a few of the major producers, which made it difficult for independent producers like Kleine to circulate their films widely enough to cover production costs. But even worse, producer distributors were beginning to acquire first-round theaters, and conversely, theater chains were venturing into production. Uh, Kleine feared that this double movement toward vertical integration would nail the doors shut for independent producers and distribu distributors once and for all. He made his position known in the trade press and elsewhere, and he also did his best to supply the government with documents that allegedly gave evidence to various forms of monopolization within the film industry. His, but resistance was futile. Uh, accordingly, Kleine had to design actual business practices in the face of vertical, in vertical integration. But why didn't he try to acquire first-run theaters himself? Well, from the sound of it, he wasn't willing, uh, but even if he had been, it is debatable whether he had a fin financial muscle to carry the investment. Uh, either way, his main blunder was not the failure to venture into exhibition, but the decision to dismantle his national distribution system in 1918. Not all companies uh, that thrived in Hollywood were, were, were vertically integrated giants. And if Kleine had strengthened his distribution branch, he could perhaps have had a better future in store. He made the decision, however, on business grounds, in other words, due to unprofitability. Uh, the point, uh, this points to an underlying problem, namely a lack of box office value. If Kleine's films, including both his own productions and the ones he distributed for others, would have been of higher quality he would have had a better access to the first round circuit of movie theaters, and perhaps in the long run, even been able to amass the power to start investing in movie theaters himself, or at least retain his position as a leading national distributor. This raises new questions. Uh, why the subpar standard of his product? What kinds of production policies were to blame? Uh, more generally, how was box office value actually built? What caused some pictures to hit the jackpot and others to flop? Uh, to this day, and quite intriguingly, no one really knows. Uh, or, as in screenwriter William Goldman's adage about the entertainment industry, nobody knows anything. Uh, this messy show business quality of film economics, as film historian Richard Kozarski calls it, uh, has to do with what, what economists talk about in terms of fundamental uncertainty. Uh, the main problem for a film producer is that the economic value of the commodity he is selling can only be determined as it is being consumed, but not prior to the act of consumption. Kleine was obviously aware of this. Uh, writing to an associate at, at the Edison Company in 1917, he jokingly predicted that someday a man will be born with mathematical certainty in selecting and making winners. When he happens, he will get all the money in the world. Excuse me. Uh, meanwhile, they all had to try to do their best to come up with some kind of winning concept. Uh, in other words, they had to act as if they knew what the audience would like. Um, Kleine came, came to the same conclusion as many of his peers and as many, many producers after him, namely that a film would go, no, go nowhere unless it had A, a female star, and B, high production values, or what Kleine referred to as a bigness. Kleine only rarely followed his own advice, um, and many of the times he did, the experience confirmed what he was already aware of, namely that these were perhaps necessary conditions, but hardly sufficient. Um, take the case of Du Barry, uh, made in 1914 and released in 1915. Uh, this was a film adaptation of David Belasco's successful stage play from a few years earlier, and the film version starred Mrs. Leslie Carter, who had made her stage career through the title role in the very same play. Uh, Kleine spent over $100,000 in this production, and it was supposed to establish him uh, as a high-end American producer in his own right, and not just a mere importer and distributor of foreign films. Uh, 
Uh, but the production was beset by problems from the start, to some extent caused by unwarranted interferences by Mrs. Carter, uh, but also due to forces out, out of um, Kleine's control, or other forces out of Kleine's control. Uh, the picture was finished, uh, but test screenings indicated that its appeal was virtually a zero. Uh, silly enough, the one thing that test viewers couldn't swallow um, was Mrs. Carter's age. She was much too old to play someone who was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in the world, or so they argued. For a later reissue of the film, Klein addressed the problem by cutting out as many of the close-ups and tight framings as possible without messing up the narrative continuity. Uh, but the film never had much of a run, and Klein never recuperated more than a small fraction of the production cost. Debacles like this uh, caused production practice to clash with business theory. As mentioned, Kleine recognized the importance of large production values embodied by the presence of the expensive star, but it didn't seem to work out for Kleine in practice. Uh, this made him reluctant to pay big bucks for the A-list film stars, and instead he rallied against rapidly rising star salaries in the film industry. He based much of his reasoning on a conservative business philosophy, evident in his growing fondness of self-identifying as conservative businessman. It's, it's not exactly clear what he meant by this, uh, but his ideal business model involved a stable organization running at maximum efficiency at minimum cost, uh, producing a steady output of films that rendered predictable returns on, on investment. But there was just one flaw. Uh, there were no predictable returns on investment in the film business. And the calculations of averages implied by his model were mostly irrelevant. Uh, an economist might explain this with reference to the high kurtosis of the revenue distribution in the film economy, or in plain English, a few monster hits uh, account for most of the revenue, and these few hits uh, have to carry the losses of the many non-hits. And in fact, Kleine realized this, uh, and he also recognized the wild uncertainty of the movie economy uh, that we discussed earlier, uh, yet he failed to connect the dots, especially the role of unsuccessful films within this type of economy. Uh, over the second half of the 19-teens, he grew increasingly convinced that the average picture was unprofitable, which led him to two conclusions. One, uh, he believed that the film industry as a whole was running on heavy annual losses. Given what we have just said about the movie economy being, being a kurtocracy rather than a mediocracy, uh, we know that this was, wasn't necessarily the case, and Kleine might have been right, but that is sort of besides the point. Uh, Secondly, Kleine argued that the failure of the average picture was an indication of overproduction and waste in the film industry. Uh, in open as well as private letters, he tried to convince his fellow filmmen to downsize their operations. His activi activism gained some momentum during the First World War when Kleine co Kleine's calls for cutbacks appeared to dovetail with the moral imperative of wartime frugality. In the end, however, uh, the only one who voluntarily scaled down was Kleine himself. Uh, uh, he almost completely dismantled his distribution organization, and he put a halt to virtually all of his production activity. Uh, this inaugurated the next phase of his career, which was defined by occasional bouts of independent filmmaking and ad hoc distribution arrangements. Meanwhile, uh, the companies that would uh, make up the Hollywood studio system were expanding on an unprecedented scale setting up an industry structure, structure that did, in fact, manage to alleviate some of the effects of the inherent uncertainty of the business. Instead of nurturing a fantasy and fallacy of, of profitable averages, as Kleine had, did, had done. Um, what they had figured out, uh, the emerging Hollywood companies, that is, uh, was that it didn't matter if many films were unprofitable, as long as a few films became huge hits. Uh, which meant that increased production volume could improve the odds of hitting the jackpot. And they also realized that vertical integration would allow the flops to earn back at least some of their money. Um, but this kind of expansion uh, could not be financed by previously ac accumulated profits. Enter Wall Street. Uh, so this is basically what happened, that the, the expansion of the Hollywood companies was funded by Wall Street bankers and, and investment firms. In contrast, Kleine's conservative business philosophy, philosophy uh, prescribed that he would only venture into projects that made enough sense for him to be willing to risk his own money. And this may sound like a noble policy, and Kleine did try to pit himself as sort of morally superior to, to the Hollywood producers who, uh, he said, had 
had indicated that they would be in business as long as they had a nickel to pay for the subway fare down to Wall Street. Uh, so, so Klein is sort of pitted himself as morally superior to that sort of stance. Um, but it, that was a, so it sounds noble, but it was, it was a poor policy for the mid-19th moment of transition that we're tracing here, um, when the industry took a turn toward booming production values and mass production of a kind that necessarily involved a kind, uh, an amount of recklessness and, and risk preference uh, that was at all sort of incompatible with Kleine's uh, business philosophy. And this, again, marks a shift in Kleine's career, further and further away from the commercial aspects of motion pictures, and more and more in the direction of work that aimed to infuse motion pictures with other forms of value than monetary value. And the timing is interesting here, because on the one hand, in 1915, the Supreme Court handed down the so-called mutual decision, which legally defined motion pictures as, quote, business pure and simple, end quote. Uh, making clear that movies were not to be considered as, as a form of speech um, subject to First Amendment protection. Um, on the other hand, at the same juncture, discourses on film as art were rampant, and the campaign to elevate the cultural status of motion pictures had been going on for years. In other words, um, movies were legally being defined as business, and as we have seen, they were becoming big business, uh, but they were also on path to being accepted as cultural heritage. Uh, a major element of this film historical shift was the drive to reclassify film as an object, um, and reclassify it as an object that harbored not only commercial value, but also artistic, educational, and historical value. And Kleine made, made a career-long pursuit to promote this idea. He was far from alone in this, but he was more identified with this project than most other people in the industry. In a 1914 book called The Theater of Science, a volume of progress and achievement in the motion picture industry, author Robert Grau dubbed Kleine an uplifter in the moving picture field. Uh, and this uh, similar claims were, were repeated in film histories written later on in the 1920s and 1930s. Kleine garnered this reputation largely through his effort within the field of educational cinema. Uh, he had imported short educational films from Europe since he entered the film business, but received most attention for the distribution of Charles Urban's film, The Fly Pest, uh, which was widely used in, in SWAT the Fly campaigns and anti-fly crusades all over the US, um, aimed to sort of combat the, the spreading of disease uh, that fly, supposedly, well, the supposed spreading of disease by flies. Uh, so this was um, um, an activity that garnered much attention for Kleine. Another breakthrough through came in 1910 when Kleine issued a catalog of educational motion picture, pictures uh, that listed some 1,000 short subjects grouped under labels such as travel, history, naval, military, animal life, religion, kindergarten studies, and so on. Um, the catalog was considered de a decisive step onward and up upward for the status of motion pictures. And film historians to this day uh, discuss it as a landmark in the history of educational cinema. Uh, having been through more or less every scrap of paper in the George Kleine papers here at the library, I sort of tend to agree, but also arrive at the conclusion that we shouldn't sort of overestimate the, um, um, the significance of one single catalog. Because uh, as it turned out, few of the films listed in these uh, this catalog, and as, as I mentioned, there were more than 1,000 short subjects listed, but very few of them were actually available for distribution. So many of the potential customers who responded were left disappointed. Still, the catalog carried some symbolic value in terms of the promotion of motion pictures as something more than business commodities. And perhaps this is what Kleine strived for in addition to the accumulation of goodwill or the possible accumulation of goodwill. Uh, I would also like to suggest that Kleine helped establish, establish certain conditions of possibility or prerequisites for the later embrace of film as cultural heritage. In order to think of film as heritage at all, a discovery of cinema's past had to, had to take place. And this hinged on the valorization of old films, which is something we take for granted now, but well into the 19-teens, uh, film culture was nearly completely predicated on a primacy of the new. Uh, most picture theaters change program at least two or three times weekly, and many of them every day, actually. And even, even accounting for the sequential runs of films through various uh, different types of theaters, 
uh, the total shelf life of any given film was very, very short. Uh, and most films were casually discarded when their commercial value had been exhausted. And all this would change, however, uh, with the appearance of longer multi-reel feature films. Um, since these longer feature length films uh, were best exploited through longer exhibition spans and also elaborate publicity campaigns um, that sort of set the stage for later reissues. And Kleine was instrumental in this transition from mixed cinema programs of short films uh, to programs built around feature length films uh, as he imported some of the earliest multi-reel feature films to appear on the US markets. Above all, his exploitation of the Italian spectacle film Quo Vadis in 1913 set new standards for the marketing and presentation of motion pictures. Uh, the flexible release plans um, and extended commercial life of features helped soften up the primacy of the new, um, as did the increasingly common practice of reissuing old films, pioneered by Kleine and others. The educational catalog that we discussed earlier is one example of, of this practice of reissuing. Um, uh, and, Kleine, and throughout the 19-teens and 1920s, Kleine tried to make it a habit to reissue his back catalog of films. Not without discrimination, but, but neither with the sort of systematic criteria of inclusion and exclusion that, for example, later film archives perhaps would do. But, but, but the important point here is that 5, 10, or even 15 or 20 year old films were uh, being placed on the market again, which was a precondition for the discovery of cinema's past, I'd argue. Kleine also made a premature attempt to nominate a canon of film masterpieces by issuing what he dubbed the George Kleine's Cycle of Film Classics. Um, this cycle was first issued in 1916 and then at various intervals uh, throughout the rest of his career. It consisted, of the spectacle, it consisted of the spectacles and epics that Kleine had imported from Europe in 1913 and 1914 uh, plus some American productions made either by his own production company or the Edison Company. Uh, the word classic had several connotations, not least linked to uh, classical education, but it was also meant to signify a film masterpiece, as the following quote from the promotional booklet from 1916 makes clear. Quote, we call them classics, and we use the term advisedly. Literature, music, sculpture has its classics, its masterpieces, if you please, and so has this newer art. Uh, the attempt at canon building failed, uh, possibly because of lacking merit of at least some of, this, of the films that was included in the cycle, uh, but the attempt was also premature in some more profound way. We know that there's a politics of the canon and a sociology of taste, but how a film canon appears in the first place and why some attempts to inaugurate a canon, like this attempt, fails is a slightly different uh, issue. In Kleine's case, there was a lack of credibility um, since he, he only sort of touted his own wares as canon worthy, so that may have cast some doubts as to his in intentions and motives. Uh, either this sort of reduced Kleine's clout as a tastemaker, or he lacked such clout from the outset. There could also have been a sort of catch-22 in force, according to his masterpieces, was identified as a key for the recognition of film as art, but as film was not yet recognized as an art, there was no point of authority from which to articulate the canon. Uh, this is a speculation, but, but um, either way, Kleine was not uh, occupying this point of authority. Either way. Um, Kleine's case of premature canonization was also burdened by a highbrow air that he wished to breathe into his cycle of classics. This was part of a larger project that spanned the second half of his career and that aimed to realize a form of highbrow cinema that catered primarily to a cultured elite rather than the masses, or only secondarily to the masses. Kleine explicitly pitted this vision of an alternative cinema against what he saw as the bland and mindless entertainment promulgated by Hollywood. In so doing, he tapped into wider anxieties over the course American cinema was taking after 1915. Anxiety, anxieties that were exacerbated by Hollywood's increasingly triumphant global expansion. In Europe and other places outside the US, Hollywood cinema was the cause of fear, anxiety, revulsion, and revolt, uh, but there were pockets of resistance within the US too, and Kleine was one such pocket. Uh, it was not expansion or globalization per se that he argued against. It was the type of cinema 
that was shipped overseas, and the image of America that this cinema would promote across the globe. Kleine charged Hollywood films with being cheap, sensational, and offering too many images of fast life, lawlessness, and debased womanhood. And here he echoed many progressive reformers of the era. Kleine found the Theta Bara vampire movies especially objectionable and condemned the numerous films, quote, involving the love triangle, end quote. Underpinning this anxiety was a kind of injection theory of film, according to which moving images had an instant power to corrupt its audience, especially women, children, and immigrants. And this was linked to a wider debate of the social role of the film medium. And not all views were as extreme as what I'm here calling the injection theory. But if there was one point uh, of consensus in these uh, debates, it was that movies had an immense potential to influence people, for good or for bad. And the issue then was not mu as much whether to regulate, but how to regulate film content. The Hollywood industry, too, uh, agreed on this, uh, but apparently the system of self-regulation that Hollywood put in place did not appease all, especially those who kept clamoring for federal censorship. Kleine was against federal censorship, uh, as were several of the uh, progressive reform groups, but Kleine dist distanced himself from these groups in other ways. Um, while he agreed for, with, for instance, the Better Films movement on many of their basic, basic ideas, he suggested that most reformers and their movements uh, engaged in lots of talk but little action. In contrast, he saw his own, as his own mission to bring about uplift in practice. His idea was to launch an alternative American cinema based on a combination of educational films, wholesome entertainment, and highbrow cultural ideals. This involved a two-step process. First, he had to amass a supply of such films, or films that met these standards. Here, he relied primarily, again, on his own cycle of film classics, as well as his backlog of educational short films. Then, he had to establish a distribution system that guaranteed that these films would reach exhibition sites in a timely manner. Uh, his strategy was to place this, these films at extension, extension divisions at state universities, uh, who in turn would distribute them to schools, churches, and community associations, and so on. So this was a sort of setting up of a non-theatrical market for motion pictures. Uh, this resulted in the formation of so-called institutional film exchanges in about 20 different states in the early 1920s. The goal was to set up institutional exchanges in all states, but this was never reached. Conditions varied too much, um, and the problem of how to establish a stable system for non-theatrical distribution remained unsolved. Neither did Kleine reach his goal of establishing a higher standard for film culture in general. Kleine's assumption was that the inferior quality of the standard Hollywood fare came about because Hollywood producers catered to a mass audience, or as Kleine referred to it, the miscellaneous audience. On average, this audience had primitive tastes, ethics clouded, and culture underdeveloped, he argued. Uh, and it was only too predictable that the supply would be shaped by that sort of demand. Hollywood was, was giving the masses what they wanted, and the result was deplorable, according to Kleine. Um, as we have seen, Kleine's solution was the cultivation and expansion of the non-theatrical markets. This niche could effectively cater to a small minority of film lovers, and this is Kleine's words, not mine, uh, thus establishing a cultural and moral standard. And once this non-theatrical market grew sizable enough, this standard would, quote, win its way to the masses, or so Kleine imagined. This was basically a conservative, elitist, sort of trickle-down theory of cultural refinement, but the premise of the theory outlived Kleine and became a staple of anti-Hollywood sentiment across the globe, from left to right, um, and from, from uh, Kleine's times to present day, I would argue. Unfortunately for, unfortunately for Kleine and later champions of highbrow cinema, Hollywood persists, uh, much thanks to its remarkable capacity to absorb and to adapt. And this brings us, uh, probably not full circle, but to some concluding remarks anyway. In sum, Kleine's conservative business model, as well as his highbrow aspirations, placed him at odds with the historical trends of his time. This brings into focus how the emergence of Hollywood, and in extension, cinema as we still know it, was predicated on a massive influx of risk capital that made possible boosted production values, as, as well as vertical integration. We've also seen how Hollywood's mass appeal and middle-brow sensibility were key to its remarkable success as national as well as global film culture. 
Pushed to the margins, Kleine came to devote less and less time to commercial operations in the 1920s, and more and more time uh, to various attempts to valorize motion pictures as art form, educational tool, or historical document. These were important, although premature, steps toward the later acceptance of film as cultural heritage. So what comes to the fore is, in a sense, the anatomy of a failure. But as such, it offers us not only renewed perspectives on dominant film culture, but also a hint at the possible futures of cinema at a historical moment when nothing could be taken for granted. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Unfortunately, without the permission of the copyright owners, uh -huh. which resulted in a judgment in 1911 against him. Do you know anything about the, the, the level of the, the judicial judgment against him in 1911? No, and in fact, Kleine was not part of Calum at that point. He, he was one of the founders of Calum. Uh, Calum stands for KLM, and the K is Kleine, L is Samuel Long, and the M is for Frank Marion. So Calum, Calum. So he, he was one of the founders, but he basically bankrolled Calum and then had to get out of it because Calum uh, was awarded a license with the Motion Picture Patents Company that I mentioned in the, in the talk, the MPPC. Uh, and in order for, for, or actually Calum received a license from Edison before the MPPC was formed. And, and um, that forced Kleine out of Calum. So he was not part of Calum at the point when the Ben-Hur ben -Hur issue came up. So. Um, so I don't know, he, he, he had, had nothing to do with that. And um, to be frank, I, I haven't, you know, got into uh, the, the details about the Ben-Hur decision, but I know it's, it's a key decision that sort of, um, that uh, settled once and for all that, that you couldn't just go grab any source material uh, as, you, as, you, as you pleased. That's, so, so it totally changed the, the conditions for, for American film production at the time. So, but it was had little to do with, with Kleine, but it's a very interesting and sort of key moment in, in the early American film history. So, and it's true that Kleine was, was involved in Kalem, but only for a short period of time. Um, basically, like I said, bankrolling, or, or rather he guaranteed that Kalem, when they started production, he guaranteed that, they would, that he would buy loads and loads of prints from them, in spite of them being new and untested. On the market, so so that's that was his moment. Um, Kleine was born in the United States, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what and how long did you remain in the business? Uh, well, throughout, well, until he died in 1931. 31. So yeah, but but. Black, white, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, he wasn't producing at the time when, when sound became, sound film became the standard. So, uh, so he, he had uh, nothing to do with that transition from into the sound era, really. He was, well, he was still active, but very peripherally or at the margin. So. And um, as you said, he, he wanted to do his film uh, as high art. Or yeah, that was, that was his... Well, um, I wouldn't say it was an aversion, and, and for a while, anyway, his slate of pictures were more diverse than I uh, maybe have given you the impression of. Uh, but he was also, he was, at least in, in his correspondence and discourses and all, all over the place, he was very invested in some sort of more traditional highbrow cultural ideal. But, but he, he did, because he was a businessman, so, so he had to, uh, make a living so so he had actually I mean he wasn't he wasn't just into uh, 
know, lavish features or historical, uh, you know, uh, spectacles that would sort of supposed to be the high end of the. He also produced pretty crude comedies, to to be to be honest. Uh, that was on a sort of different scale or crude, and they were perceived to be crude. I'm, I'm not saying they were crude, but so but but so he was he was he was. Um, some, he was invested in this highbrow ideal of culture, but he was also a businessman that wanted to make money. So, uh, but he didn't um, talk very much about the comedies and the other stuff that he was putting out there. But, but sure, he was. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there are many sides too. I didn't catch the question. Can, can you repeat uh, it? In the archives, yeah. did you come across any information about the production and distribution of the posters that were The posters? Oh, all, yeah, not, not very much. There, there are copies of some of the posters, and there's, there's, there's some business correspondence with, with these companies that would make the posters for him and, and purchase orders and stuff like that. But I haven't looked at it very closely, but there is some something. Yeah, there is some stuff that you might find there. I, I can give you, um, yeah, I can, I can, let's, let's discuss it afterwards, right? Yeah. It seems from what you told us that Well, my, my, actually, my, my hypothesis, hypothesis for the moment is this exactly this conservative business philosophy that sort of made it impossible for him to, uh, to expand because for the type of expansion that was needed to transition into the Hollywood era, you, you, well, basically, you needed risk capital or, or some, some form of outside investment, and, and he refused. He, he would only invest his own money and and uh, it, it would only invest in projects that were on a scale that he could sort of finance himself or maybe partner up with someone, but he, he refused any kind of, of uh, you know, involvement from, from, from the bankers and from Wall Street. So had he uh, been more open to that, who knows? Because he, he kept on going and he tried and he, he had a huge distribution uh, organization for a while and distribution is key for, for sort of the power of the Hollywood system if you control distribution, you can sort of manage your way to controlling on pretty much everything else. So there was potential there, and he had a couple of hits even after 1915. He had uh, the occasional hit uh, film like The Unbeliever, for example. It was a World War One war war film. So, so there were the occasional hits, and he had the distribution system, and maybe he could have, uh, yeah, or that, yeah, I I'd say he could have, could have. Uh, well, for the moment, I think it's, it was his, his conservatism more than anything else, actually. I was curious what brought to the courts um, a case that had to be decided as to whether film was a business or a matter of... Yeah, the, 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 it's, it's called the Mutual case, which refers to, to a film company called the Mutual Company. Uh, and they had, I don't know the exact details, but because at the time, uh, censorship was, was a local thing. So the, many states would have their local censorship boards uh, and some, some were more harsh than others. And this case involved the Ohio censors that had somehow interfered or wanted to make cuts or something in, in films distributed by Mutual, the Mutual Company. And they, the Mutual Company brought this to to the courts, because the Ohio Constitution had something similar to the First Amendment uh, that they argued would, would protect their films as a form of speech. So that was what the whole issue was about. Mutual was arguing that, well, film is a form of speech, and hence, it should be protected by the First Amendment. So the Ohio, Ohio censor can go elsewhere. <laughs> so that was what the case was about. And it's, yeah, it's one of those landmark cases, like the Ben-Hur case that you were not one of those landmark cases from this period that, uh, that we tend to discuss. <laughs>
sure. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.